Yeah, everybody see my, uh, just speak up if you can see my screen properly. I have no way of knowing whether you can see it. Can you see the, maybe, Arthur, can you tell me if you can see the slide? Yes, for sure. The okay. welcome slide, yeah. That's great, okay. Okay, so um, once again, thank you very much um, for coming along tonight for what I think will be an interesting discussion. Um, our two, uh, the issue we're gonna be discussing is, is Israel really a settler colonial enterprise? Um, it will be, a, I've been, for some time people have been saying to me that the Ottawa Forum Israel-Palestine could be doing a, a favor if we could organize a discussion or debate where people had different views. And so I'm thrilled to have two people, both who are members of the Ottawa Forum and Israel-Palestine Advisory Council, both of whom agree that what Israel is doing to the Palestinians is unfair and unjust, but have different, slightly different analyses on how to um, approach it and what needs to be done about it. Um, the people are uh, Michael Seguin, who's a professor at St. Paul University, I'll introduce him in a minute, and Arthur Milner, um, the Canadian author and playwright, Mikhail thinks, yes, this is a good approach, and Arthur is not so sure that's a good approach, and he'll explain or argue why that's the case. Um, we're, we're starting now, uh, about five minutes or so, uh, about background and introductions to the issue and to the debate, and then we'll get into the discussion. And in the discussion period, basically, uh, we've agreed that uh, Mikhail will talk for about 10 minutes of his perception of why this is a good and useful framework. Arthur will have about the same amount of time to respond to that. And then uh, the three of us will get into discussions. I will try to uh, ask some clarifying questions or poke some holes in some arguments. And that will go until about quarter after eight. And then we have about a half an hour of questions and answers from the audience. Now, please put your question, you're invited to ask questions, especially if you disagree with the uh, anything that's said. Um, or it doesn't have to be a question. It can be a, 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 a succinctly expression of your disagreement. But please um, uh, put anything you're hoping to get answered in the question and answer box. Uh, I have set things up so that the chat is on. You can put comments in the chat. You can speak to uh, any of us or to each other. But I won't be picking up questions from the uh, Q, from the chat section, only from the Q and A. Um, I also want to draw your attention to the next uh, OFIP uh, webinar, which will be uh, take place uh, on Sunday, March 19th at two o'clock. This will be a very interesting interview with a young woman, a Palestinian refugee writer named Fida Jiris, about returning to Palestine at the age of 22. She was born of refugee parents in Lebanon and finally returned to Palestine at the age of um, 22, but, but realized when she got there that the Palestine she had heard about isn't the Palestine that she come into because she's now coming into Israel. And she'll be interviewed by De Rabbi David Mivaser, and I think that will be a very interesting conversation. Now, just briefly, the debate tonight is about settler colonialism. This is not a term, term that I was very familiar with as, as recently as a year ago. Uh, I was, of course, familiar with the term colonialism, and you see the picture there of British India. Colonialism is a practice or policy of control of one people or power over people uh, or, or areas for economic benefit. Settler colonialism was sort of a mystery to me. I, I thought maybe it was a worse kind of colonialism, but now I've read and I now think it's widely accepted that settler colonialism is different. It's a type of colonialism, but one in which foreign settlers move to and permanently take up residence on the land that has already been inhabited by someone else. So the picture on there are Canadian settlers. So cl classic colonialism in India, settler colonialism in North America. Just a quick reminder of what we're talking about, the geographic area. <clears throat> There's a total approximate population of about 13 million people living in between the river and the sea, that is to say between the Mediterranean uh, Sea over here and the Jordan River here. About nine and a half live in what Canada would recognize as Israel proper, and about 2.4 million live in the West Bank, and about 1.8 million live in Gaza. 
Um, but in the whole area, it's about 50% Jews and non-Jews today. Now, Israel today is a modern Western type country. Uh, it's a per capita GDP is about $32,000 per person, which makes it like a Mediterranean country like Greece or, 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 or Spain, perhaps. Um, it has modern, modern highways, high tech. It has a light, <clears throat> light rail in Jerusalem that functions a lot better than the one in Ottawa. Um, and it has about 20% of its population are um, non-Jews. They are Palestinian citizens of Israel, which Israel calls Arab Israelis. They may call themselves Palestinian, but they're talking about the same people. That is the, the people who didn't leave and the descendants of those who didn't leave or flee in 1948, 47, 48. Uh, they're citizens of Israel. They have the right to vote. They represent the Knesset. They could elect their own mayors of their towns and villages. They can and own their own houses. Arabic is recognized in Israel as a special language. There are many mosques in Israel. They can travel anywhere they want. And so now I lead into the question of, uh, with that background, can Israel really be described as a settler colonial venture? If it is, uh, then um, uh, the question would be, um, I can't see what the question was, oh, how to describe it. And then, and, and if, 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 if it's not a settler colonial venture, how would you describe it? If it is a settler colonial venture, what do you do about it? What, what's the consequences? So um, we have two speakers with two different views. The first one, both of these uh, folks, I have been to visit Israel-Palestine separately with. Um, the first is Arthur Milner. Arthur, I've known Arthur, I've known for 40 years. We went to uh, uh, Israel-Palestine 12 years ago together. He is former resident playwright and then artistic director at the Great Canadian Theatre Company in Ottawa. He is an author of plays, so he has authored 15 plays that have been produced and published, including two about Israel-Palestine, Masada in 1991 and Facts in 2010. And Facts toured Canada and Europe and was also produced in Arabic and toured 19 cities in the West Bank and Israel in 2012. His most recent play is called Getting to Room, Room Temperature. It's actually a funny and sort of bittersweet uh, story about um, uh, um, assisted assisted dying and basically around the case of his dying mother. Um, Michael, Michael Seguin uh, is an assistant professor at the Providence School of Transformative Leadership and Spirituality in the St. Paul University here in Ottawa. He has a doctorate in sociology from the University of Montreal. He specializes in equity, diversity, and inclusion, and his doctoral research analyzed settler colonialism and the representation of the Palestinian that it fosters. So maybe I can ask you two fellows, please uh, bring turn your videos back on so we can see you in real life. And um, I can stop share. There we go. All right. Welcome. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for um, joining us. Arthur, you were saying it's very cold in Regina. It's actually pretty cold in Ottawa, too. But probably not Regina cold. But uh, how cold is it in, in Regina where you are, Arthur? Well, today's high was minus 22. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, yes, it's definitely colder. <laughs> but I, I do want to say that on Sunday, it's supposed to go up to zero. So we do have something to live for. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for, uh, I'm glad you didn't have to brave the elements. And in fact, one of the advantages of Zoom, of course, is OFIP used to organize public meetings and to organize a public meeting when it's snow and minus 20 is difficult to do and Zoom allows people in Ottawa to come, but also allows us to bring in um, uh, high quality resources like bringing you in Arthur as well. So that's terrific. All right, <laughs> gentlemen, let's get to work. Um, Mikhail, we agreed that you would um, start off and you had some, you, you wanted to uh, uh, show a few slides to start or do you want to just start talking first and then? Uh, yeah, I'll just share them. Just give me a second. Do I need to do something to allow you to share screen. Uh, yeah, give me some magic power. Okay. Uh, I think I said you, I said participants can share screens. So tr can you try it? No, can. So if you if you make me co-host or something oh, like that, okay. I, will I should that. be yeah, able. I, I will do that. I'll make you co-host. There you go. Yes. Okay. Ah, wonderful! It works. Great. We see it. Okay. Perfect. So um, 
Uh, you, you gave us, Peter, some definitions. Sorry, I'm a sociologist and I'm a scholar, so I need to add some extra layers of definition because I, I want to frame it. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, so I really want to frame settler colonialism from a more sociological perspective. And so to start with, let's say there's two basic characteristics of colonialism in general. First is the movement of settlers through the settler uh, through space, and the second one is there uh, is the exogenous the domination over a specific polity. So uh, in colonialism, uh, people move from a country to another, and they move to dominate to to and to dominate a specific polity. And so those two criteria are very important because it's what distinguish a settler from both immigrants who don't move to dominate, and from native elites who may will dominate, but are do not move, uh, I mean, through vast amount of space. And uh, you made a the, the, the distinction between colonialism and settler colonialism. And, and one, the, one distinction that I find helpful is um, Gabriel Peterberg, who call who make the distinction between metropole colonialism and settler colonialism. And metropole colonialism is what we basically uh, mean when we refer to colonialism. It's That's the argument that most Israeli scholars use to say that Israel is not colonialism. And what is metropole colonialism? It's, it's colonialism based on domination for economic exploitation. So it's when you need the native as an instrument. And so, and, and the basic difference in with settler colonialism is that in settler colonialism, it's domination based uh, based on uh, for the sake of uh, transfer. You need to remove people from the map to replace them and to build a new social order. I mean, a new polity. That's the story of United States. That's the story of Canada. That's the story of of Australia and many other places, including in the Middle East. And that's my contention tonight that we can apply that to uh, Israel as well. Uh, and more broadly to political Zionism. So if we want to put a picture on it, that is a picture of what metropole colonialism is about. And that's a picture of what settler colonialism is about. So the first one is about getting a lot of resources in your pocket. The second one is about erasing a population to build a new society uh, over it. And there are various strategies uh, when you are into uh, a settler colonial mood and various strategies to make people disappear. And you can make them disappear practically, but you can also make them di di disappear discursively uh, in order to grab their land. And uh, Lorenzo Veracini was one of the leader of, of this field in, in terms of scholarly output, I identified 26 strategies. So I won't go over those strategies, those 26, but uh, my next step is to try to apply a few of them to the case of Israel. And so he's talking about something like necropolitical transfer. That's very, that's the classical one, that's that's genocide. Uh, another one is ethnic transfer. So ethnic linking. Uh, you basically bring people to flee the place so that you can better occupy it afterwards. Um, but another one that is a bit more sophisticated is transfer by conceptual displacement. So you reconcile, you reconceptualize people in order to assign them to a new identity. That's basically what we did with First Nation in Canada, calling them Indians. So they are not native, they are Indians. We're not sure what it refers to, and we can take the space for ourselves. Another is transfer by assimilation. So that was the case in Canada, killing the Indian and the child. You're there to uplift people. So you're transforming them into something better. Let's become Canadian. And we can see something similar that being happening, especially uh, within Israel proper, I think. Uh, then you can get narrative transfer. You know, you rewrite history to your own advantage. You can get transfer by courts lifestyle change, basically when you um, you bring people to a sedentary uh, lifestyle. That's what Israel basically did with the Bedouins. I'll come back to that in a moment. You can get administrative transfer when you redraw the borders or diplomatic transfer, it fits through peace agreement. So there's various way to re reshape history, to erase the other that are not necessarily only to ethnic cleansing or to genocide. And, um, and that in itself defines what is settler colonialism. And one last key theoretic point, and then I'll go to the practice, is that in settler colonialism, invasion is a structure. It's not an event. Nagba is a process. It's not a single moment in uh, happening only at one point. It's a process through times where you keep erasing the other as a settler majority to take their place, to occupy uh, the, the social space too based on your own narrative. And so when we look at 
at Israel-Palestine. Um, there is nothing new with this map. You probably all know about it, those various status. And we can see that there are, according to my reading, various strategies uh, of transfer. Some are similar, some are, are different. And I would like to look especially at the strategies that are being applied within Israel proper and strategies that are being applied uh, within um, the West Bank and Gaza. And so uh, when we look at, um, at what is uh, common in terms of strategies, uh, ethnic transfer is probably pretty obvious. So in order to erase the uh, Palestinians from history, there was the Nakba in 1948 to expel uh, three quarter of a million of Palestinian refugees, don't allow them to come back. But the same happened too with the Six Day War, uh, about uh, 306,000 uh, uh, 306, uh, people uh, were also displaced during the, the Six Day War. And that's also a way uh, to erase their presence. Another one, another strategy that is the pretty uh, classical colonial settler strategy is narrative transfer. And as you know, as uh, Going back to uh, Zingli saying a land uh, without a people for, with, uh, for a people without a land is a fairly typical uh, way of framing things based on European settler colonialism. And, and so you build a narrative where uh, the other is simply not there, or you build a narrative where the other is irrelevant. So this whole story of making, making uh, the desert bloom is also a way to invalidate the presence of others. And, and, and by the way, you, you one of two things that are interesting with settler colonialism, I think, in terms of analysis, uh, is that the first is that it allows to compare Israel with similar cases. And so we can compare it with Australia, we can compare it with what Morocco is doing in Western Sahara, we can co compare that with what Turkey is doing with the Kurds. There's there's, it, we stop being uh, lo looking at Israel as something unique and singular, but we'll look at trends that might be similar in other places. And um, another thing uh, that is important with this paradigm is that we're not only looking at the West Bank, but we're looking at the old set, uh, the old Israeli enterprise, the old uh, Zion, uh, political Zionist enterprise, going back to Theodor Herzl, who himself has some few very crunchy, crispy, uh, settler colonial way of, of seeing things, um, especially when he wanted to, to sell this settlement enterprise to the Sultan or uh, to other uh, potential sponsors. Another way to foster transfer uh, is true transfer uh, by settler and denigenization. <laughs> so that, I'm sorry, that's too hard. To, that's a mouthful for a francophone. Um, and so it's, it's, it's this whole idea of Jewish coming back to um, the Judean kingdom, to where they were exiled uh, 2,000 years ago. And, you know, they are, that they are going back to their, their real home and that the Arabs are the settlers. So a way to discredit people who are there uh, is to make yourself the indigenous. And that's something that did not, that was there from the start, but has is becoming more and more um, current, let's say, in recent years, as Israel is attempting to fight back against this idea that it might be a settler colonial uh, enterprise. The other way that is very classical to uh, transfer population is to transfer settlers. I mean, Israel, since 1948, uh, allowed uh, roughly uh, 3 million Jews to immigrate overnight through the law of return. Uh, and almost none uh, uh, Palestinian refugees were, the, were allowed to come back. And we can look at the same with the West Bank with the more than uh, 600,000 uh, refugees uh, currently living there. Another way to uh, transfer, uh, to transfer uh, that is part of, uh, of this settler colonial mindset is through administrative uh, transfer. So all, it's how you play with the boundaries. How do you uh, redraw the boundaries of cities, for example, within Israel proper, to make sure that maximum land goes to Jewish uh, cities and minimum land goes to uh, to Arab cities. And Israel did the same in 67 after the Six Day War with Jerusalem, the way it drew the, the boundaries and again through the construction of the wall. So we can see a way of playing with boundaries to to really uh, pack up Palestinians in small spaces where you don't see them as much as possible. 
another way that was uh, used with the Bedouins is transfer by course lifestyle change. And so in, in the Negev in the 1960s, 70s, this whole idea of concentrating all the Bedouin, so nomadic population in seven cities uh, was a way to erase them or to pack them in some very tiny spots. So in order to build Jewish ranches uh, in the Negev desert. And the same is happening with the Jalin Bedouins and other Bed Bedouin tribes uh, in the West Bank. And finally, one uh, last classical uh, mean to transfer population of to at least make them disappear from the public view is true criminal so it's pretty obvious in the case of the political prisoners, so roughly uh, 4,500 political, Palestinian political prisoners in Israel, in Israeli jail. But another best kept secret is the over-representation of, uh, of Arab Israeli in Israeli jail. So uh, Arab Israeli are roughly 20% of the Israeli population, but they are 40% of the Israeli, uh, uh, the, the Israeli carceral population. And we're talking about uh, uh, Palestinians Arab who are fully Israeli citizens. And, you know, we can compare that with other uh, settler colony like, like Canada. And so what is this, what is different when, we, when it comes to what is unique to Palestinians of 48 versus Palestinians of, of 67? Well, the first thing is that um, there was a very strong attempt by the Israeli state to reconceptualize the identity of the Palestinians who remain within Israeli borders after the 1948 war. And that was through the construction of Arab Israeli, this weak identity that is in no way uh, in Israeli's educational system tied to a culture, tied to the land, tied to the history of Palestinians, but is referring to some kind of Ab Abbasid or Omeyyad empire that existed a few thousand years ago. Um, and that was a real way to uh, create a new identity that would weaken any, any statement of indigeneity of, on the basis of, Pal of Palestinians. And by the same token, Arab Israeli are invited to fully assimilate within the Israeli collective and, and to forget uh, their, their culture. And in case they were not sure that they wanted to forget their Israeli culture, there's the Nakba law adopted a few a decade ago, making sure that there won't be any word of, of Nakba uh, or what happened in 48 in Israeli um, school system for Arabs. When we look at the strategies for the Palestinians in 1967, um, it, it, it it's again a strategy to erase their prison, but that a more brutal one. Let's say that the strategies within Israel proper are a bit more subtle. Well, but when it comes to the occupied territories, we're, we're simply uh, into um, necropolitical transfer. So let's look at what's happening uh, what happened yesterday in Nablus or what's happening every time there's a fire exchange between Gaza and the IDF, there's always a disproportionate amount of Palestinians who are dying. And uh, some might argue that their death is not only casualties, but part of a transfer strategies. Uh, and also uh, a lot of, of, of scholars arguing that Oslo, the Oslo peace process ended up being a transfer strategy, a way through the delimitation of area A, B, and C to get to area C, which is 60% of the West Bank, which is basically now under Israeli sovereignty uh, with settlements and all kind of, you know, uh, land reserve, military bases, uh, fire field range that are there to facilitate transfer of this land into uh, Israeli uh, ends. So, um, those are basically just a quick run of various uh, transfer strategies. And I, I know that I'm already over time. So my, that's my, my, my last slide. How is this framework helpful? Well, I think that adopting a, 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 the paradigm of uh, settler colonial, colonialism help, help us delineate differently what's the end goal uh, of any peace settlement. And if we compare that with what's happening in Canada, then the goal will be decolonization. How, how do we, not so much one state, two states, three states, but how do we get rid of a colonial way of thinking? And that uh, implies a few things, such as moving away from political Zionism. Do we, need, do we necessarily need to, to move into anti-Zionism? Anti not sure, maybe some kind of 
post-Zionism would be enough. But this idea of having a, Jew, a state only for the Jews is a very uh, colonial idea where you will never get equality uh, for all the residents in, 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 in Israel-Palestine. There's a need also to rewrite history and dialogue with, with, with the colonized, with, with the Palestinians. It also implies to recognize the wrongs that, that were being done to the Palestinian people and uh, the need for reparations and for the three segments of the Palestinian people, for the citizen Israeli, uh, Palestinian citizen of Israel, for the refugees in the diaspora or in refugee camps, and for uh, people living under occupation. Uh, it also implies recognizing Palestinians' rights to the land and renegotiating re sovereignty. Um, and so it, we're, we're leaving this paradigm of just a fight between two people, but one that has been trying to erase the presence of the other, and how do we undo that as much as we can? And a, a legal tool that might be helpful in that struggle is to refer to the United Nations Declaration of Rights of the Indigenous Peoples um, that might set up some parameters when it comes to Indigenous sovereignty, recognition, recognition of Indigenous culture, traditions, rights, and right to access to uh, healthcare and different services. That's it thank for now. Merci, Michael. Thank you very much. Yes, you did go over 10 minutes, so I'm going to have to give Arthur more, uh, uh, as much time as he wants to to answer, but you certainly laid out a lot of things uh, for us to consider uh, there, and thank you very much for uh, putting in a slide as well, help us see that. And by the way, um, I will, uh, with your permission, I will uh, make those slides available when I yeah. um, send out a follow-up um, email to everybody who, who attended. So Arthur, um, he gave you an awful lot to chew on. How do you want to work away at this? That's yeah. Um, well, I, I can't say there's, you know, much in there that um, I disagree with. Uh, I don't object to the term settler colonialism. Um, and your description of the details seem to be mostly apt and unarguable. Um, however, uh, really the big problem for me is I don't really see how it's useful, how it gets us to where we need to go. And the big question for me is, and, and has been probably for 20 years, is whatever the Palestinians decide that they want, how do we get Israel to comply? That seems to me really the only question, the only two questions perhaps, what do Palestinians want, which might include one state, two states, you know, an answer of that order, or the end of the occupation, I think is definitely in there. But the big question is, how do we get Israel to comply? And I don't see what outlining in detail how it's a settler colonial state uh, gets us there. Um, so, so that's really the big question. I did in my researching, I, I mentioned earlier that when I was uh, preparing for this debate, I didn't really know what your arguments were going to be. And so I had to like plan for all arguments. And I did come across an interesting article in people who argue that the settler colonial model is not appropriate to Israel. And one of the interesting things I found, you probably have come across this too, Mikhail, is um, an article by Stephen Lubit and Jonathan Zasloff in, in Haaretz, uh, professors in law at, in the United States. And they say, Settler colonialists bring with them their language and culture and impose these on these on their new neighbors. And if we look around the world, that seems to be fairly true. They speak English in Australia, and where did they come from? Britain. So, um, but Ashkenazi Jews, the Zionists, abandoned their languages. Polish, Russian, Yiddish, etc. They revived and learned a local language, Hebrew. They didn't name any towns, New South Warsaw or Prince Edward Island. And they even changed their own German and Russian sounding names 
to Middle Eastern sounding names. And Lubit and Zasloff would say they did all this because, um, according to Lubit and Zaslav, Zionists thought they were not colonizing, but going home. Now, so does that make your analysis wrong? No, I don't think it does. Um, because it's an analysis, it's based on how you define the word that you're applying. And, and that seems to me, you know, a bit easy. If you're an academic, you get to make up the definition of the word, and then you explain <laughs> why the word applies where you're applying it. And some other academic makes up a different definition, and they go, no, it doesn't apply because we made up a different definition. And I was thinking of the difference between settler colonialism, which is a kind of academic description, you know, as opposed to genocide and um, apartheid, which now are legal terms. And so you can at least argue if, if something is uh, apartheid, you can argue that something is apartheid because you have a legal definition from the statute of Rome to refer to. Now, does that actually solve the problem? I, I don't think so. You know, and the same thing is to a genocide. It's defined in the statute of Rome. But does that mean we've all stopped arguing about what's apartheid and what's genocide? No, we're still arguing about all those things. In general, I would say, I don't think these fancy words get us anywhere. They just create arguments about the words. If If Israel is charged with Gen with not genocide, but um, apartheid, I will testify against it. But other than that, it seems to me pretty much a word we just toss around at each other and deny and accuse each other of being anti-Semite if we accept it, or Zionist if we don't accept it. And it doesn't seem to me to get us anywhere. So my preference uh, would be to choose political language rather than legal or academic language and describe. I'd rather call Israel fascist than settler colonialist. I think that puts it in the political realm. realm. And then and then now what do we what do we do about it? I'm not saying we have to call Israel fascist or that it's necessarily fascist. It still depends on definitions, but it puts it in the political realm. And I think in whatever way, we need some political leadership here, not academic leadership, to get out, us out of the, the jam in which we're stuck in Israel-Palestine. So uh, I would use simpler words like um, occupation and settlements, not in the sense of settler colonialism, but as settlers, uh, discrimination, boycott and sanction, not BDS, a uh, two-state solution or a single democratic state. We don't really argue about what those words mean. We might argue about whether they're applicable and what and but I think that's the kind of language we should be using and we should get back to or I don't know get back we need to talk about how do we force Israel to do something except entrench and deepen the oppression of Palestinians, which is what's going on. You know, we've now the, we call them apartheid. Uh, major rights organizations call them apartheid. Is that changing anything? It's it's too early to tell, but my hunch is that it doesn't. Um, I could go into why I think the the occupation is central, but that's not really what I'm here to do. So I'll leave it at that. For now, thanks, uh, Arthur. I'm, I just want to clarify if I think I've understood the essence of your uh, your 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 comments. That you're not you're not challenging or in, in any significant way the the applicability of the framework of the notion of Israel being a settler colonial enterprise. I think that there are lots of people who do challenge that um, for. And let me just review what I think are a couple of the, the, the arguments that you might have raised and didn't, and perhaps you don't agree with them, but 
well, one of course is the argument about um, returning that how can you colonize uh, the country that you came from or some version of that uh, of that argument. Um, a second argument is that uh, traditionally, I mean, I appreciate that's the right word, but generally, uh, colonial enterprises come from a country. It's British colonial enterprise in India or French in North, North America or Spanish. Um, but uh, while the uh, the Zionists, returning the, the Zionists, um, had the British sponsor, they weren't British. It wasn't mostly British Jews who, who came here. So that it um, it's not colonialism. It's different from other forms of colonialism. Right? That, and therefore, the, the term doesn't apply. I, um, maybe I'll just ask Mikhail if he'd like to respond to those two, two arguments that I've heard. <clears throat> Yeah, oh, well, with we'll, we'll great pleasure. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have some answers. I'm not sure you all, everyone will, be, will agree with them, but I mean, the, the, this whole idea of, you know, um, coming back to a place that you left 2000 years ago, uh, I mean, in the cases that, that there was, a, that, 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 uh, Israel is trend that Israel Palestine is central in Judaism. Yes, that there were always Jewish communities. Yes, but this whole idea of weaponizing a way of coming back, because at the end of the day, it's not only coming back, but it's coming back with a gun, building very colonial structure like kibbutzim, like uh, you know kibbutzim where so there's a nice socialist ideals behind them, but that's the best structure that the the Zionist socialist movement could could found to occupy the maximum land with the minimum people, building all build, building um, an old school system with with the complicity uh, of the British. I mean, it's not only coming back; it's coming back to occupy the land and to build to, to build it to occupy a sovereignty. And I mean, are people coming only? Is it is it less settler colonialism because people came from multiple shtetl or m multiple towns in Eastern Europe first and then Western Europe as as things get very bad in Europe? It it's still the same. I mean, the U.S. were not built only of of British settlers. Uh, they were built of people from from different countries, and some also that were fleeing uh, persecution. Uh, but at at the end of the day. The way of occupying the land and building a polity there and overriding what was already going on is 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 something uh, very very important to to keep in mind. And the 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 fact that you know there wouldn't be any Israel if there was not this um, the British mandate on Palestine and this complicity of the Zionists with the British is is a way to show how imbued the Zionist movement was in this, uh, this European uh, settler colonial spirit, let's say. Uh, I mean, when you look at, you know, people like Ben Gurion, Herzl, Weizmann, they were not hiding themselves at all. They were pride of replying what British, uh, French, or any other European colonists were doing elsewhere in the world. It's later on when it's, it became tricky with the decolonization to claim yourself as part of the colonial movement that Israel shied away from that and basically in the in the 50s and 60s. But um, so so there's I don't think that those arguments really stand 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 the closer look uh, if we are ready to interpret the paradigm with with some some kind of adjustment. Let's say. Okay, thank you, Arthur. Um, sure, you want to comment? Yeah, please go ahead. Well, I, I think your question and, and Mikhail's uh, answer indicates how slippery the idea is. Yes, Mikhail agrees. There are features of Israeli uh, settler colonialism, Zionist settler colonialism, that are different from other settler colonials. Are they enough to make it not settler colonialism? I don't know, flip a coin, because some people will argue it is, and some people will argue it isn't. I never bought that coming back after 2,000 years from, you know, gave you an excuse to do whatever you want. But, you know, one thing that I would say, um, I don't know if, uh, if Zionism would not have succeeded without the British. I think they were educated and talented Europeans. Mm -hmm. 
And if the British hadn't gone along with it, they would have found someone else to go along with it. They were really determined. Yeah. And what in the end was the final kick that made it work um, was the Holocaust. And who was going to vote against it and fight against it after the Holocaust? Well, I don't think we include Holocausts in the normal story of the success of settler colonialism. So I think it's it's very different. But on the other hand, I've always I suggested facetiously a few years ago, and I think it, maybe it'll catch on, but that we should substitute the term refugee colonialism for settler colonialism, not only in Israel's case, because so many of the people who settled there were refugees, but in so many countries that are settler colonial states, so much of the population went there as refugees. It doesn't make life easier for the locals, for the indigenous populations, but it does say something that's more truthful about the conditions of people who came in as settlers. So I don't know, in the end, I go, I just don't find it very useful. I just don't find it, it's not like it settles the question, it just gives us something to argue about. My hunch is that the Israelis love it when we fight with each other about, is it genocide? Is it, uh, you know, all these questions, um, because it keeps us from uh, focusing on the occupation, which is where I think we need to focus. I, I do think it's a distraction. And in that sense, so I don't disagree. There are a lot of things that are true in the world, but not all, very few of them are relevant to the Palestinian struggle. And I happen to think this question of settler colonialism is not really relevant to the Palestinian struggle. Hmm. Arthur, but, but um, okay, go ahead. If, if <laughs> I will just add one thing, one more thing, but there's there's one one way in thing I, I I I think it is very relevant. It is if if we agree that settler colonialism is about transfer of natives, we can foresee what's happening. We can explain what's happening, and we can worry so much about what's happening because. You know, when you when you look at apartheid, there's something a bit static about it. There is a system, segregation, both ways. But when you look at settler colonialism, colonialism, the goal is for all the natives to disappear. You want to erase them from the map. And that's what is happening in different ways. And, you know, settler regimes do adapt over time. And but if if we see that Israel is doing that, there's a real urgency to kick our ass and start working for the rights of the Palestinians at full speed because it might turn to be very bad at some point because the craziest of the settlers, the most right, right wing of the, the, of the Israeli Jewish supremacy, they really want to get rid of them till the last person. And that's where I think it's useful. And it's also useful to remind us from where we're speaking. And we're speaking from, you know, I mean, the Ottawa region, from Anishinaabe unceded territory. So what does, does it mean to advocate for Palestinians' rights when I know that I'm sitting myself in a state that is attempting at decolonization, but very slowly? And that, that may prevent us to be a bit too self-righteous about ourselves when we compare Canada to Israel, because Canada is a 400 years old settlement enterprise. Israel is a roughly 100 years old settlement enterprise. So it's when I say that Israel is settler colonial, it's not a way to say that they all a, a bunch of criminals that need to go into prisons. Of course, some are, crimin are criminals and war criminals, but it's also a way to see how the political future of Israel might not be that different from the political future of South Africa, of what's happening here. So it's where I find some usefulness, um, but yeah, is it really helpful? I, I mean, that's what I say to myself when I go to bed, but. Uh. <laughs> um, I'm gonna intervene here just to remind people to put your questions in the Q&A. This will I'll make, make my last question to uh, to Arthur. Put your questions, quick. I noticed that there's a number of people talking on the, um, having an ongoing debate or discussion on the chat, and that's just fine. 
I only see that out of the corner of my eye and I can't really pay attention to it. So have fun over there. And I'll put your questions for Arthur and um, Mikhail here. Arthur, um, I want to clarify something for you because, um, and I, I'm, 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 I'm just the moderator, but I'm kind of edging into argumentative territory here a little bit, but um, it, it does, don't you agree that framing it as settler colonialism um, means that the problem started in 1947-48 and that what's going on in the West Bank and the, what's, what we call the occupation, what the international community calls the occupation, only started in 1967. But that uh, in some ways you could say that inside the Green Line, the occupation or the settlement has been largely accomplished, kind of like in Canada, where in, in, the, in the West Bank, it hasn't been finished yet, which is kind of um, along Mikhail's theory that this is still, uh, it's kind of the coal face there, where largely within Israel, the domination has been um, pretty successful, not without resistance. Does, so it seems to me that that does change the frame of discussion. Do you agree with that or not? Well, I, th I think that raises so many questions that, um, you, you know, the suggestions of a one state solution would essentially apply the rules inside Israel proper to the whole place. So uh, is that a solution to based on settler, uh, an analysis of settler colonialism? I, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I, I think the question is not the analysis, but what do Palestinians want? Mm -hmm. And what is a, a solution to this that they can accept? And what is the vision of the leadership, the strategic vision of the leadership that will get them to what they want? Um, I don't see how, you know, if, if there were a solid PLO, uh, or Palestinian authority that were uh, seem to have genuine support and elected, and and they said they want such and such. I wouldn't say, but wait a second, you're ignoring the settler colonial analysis. You should want this. You you shouldn't want one state because of a settler colonial analysis, or you shouldn't want two states because of that. I I don't think that comes into it. So just in so many levels i find it not it, it not helpful okay. um, right. so yeah but some other people have some questions i'll i like to articulate some other questions that have come in sure. thank you or right, they might have cut you off on so uh joe hebert bergen says that we have political language we have international law human rights law how can we use this political language to ensure equity and peace now i'm not sure how that question fits with the settler colonial debate um either you want to tackle that one or the other i'm i'm puzzled with how that fits in with the question at hand here a clear it's clear that we point we were having a prior discussion before you before this started here that while there is international law around genocide and there is international law around apartheid there isn't at least maybe there is around settler colonialism i, I don't know do either of you know whether that is in um the Rome statute or whatever I don't know that uh, I just read the Rome statute three times in the last two weeks wow. uh, for some other debate and uh no it's not it's not in there and I you know um quite a while ago now uh shortly after uh Human Rights Watch uh published their report on apartheid um, the leader of the of Human Rights Watch in the Middle East, I, I forget his name, but he was interviewed by Peter Beinart, and and he was asked if you um, he was asked by someone about settler colonialism and has uh, Human Rights Watch looked at settler colonialism and his Israel settler colonial, and he said, well, no, we're a legal organization, and apartheid is a legal term with a legal definition, and settler and colonialism is not. It's an it's an analytical academic term, and so we haven't considered okay. it. Thank you. Um, Wolf Ehrlichman comments uh, that, of course, uh, there's a uh, this notion that Israel was a, a or Palestine was a land with no people is not 
is not true. So I'll skip over that. It's not really a question. But Robin Collins has an interesting question. He says, displacing populations is one thing, but what, what changes if the Israelis, he says in the occupied territories, it could actually be inside Israel, if they're born there? Are they still settlers, if they're the children of settlers? Um, uh, how do you deal with that in a settler colonial um, paradigm? So since you're promoting the idea, Mikhail, you've got to solve it. Well, well, I mean, if we look at different situations historically, there are kind of three basic scenarios to get rid of settler colonialism. You've got the Algerian scenario, so you've got a war and the piano are left at the end, very nasty. You get um, an, an, another scenario, which would be that basically they succeed, which is more or less the, the US and Canadian scenario until the revival of indig various indigenous cultures in the last 40 to 50 years. And then the last one is South Africa. How do we share sovereignty? And so I guess that, that's the big question of, I mean, that's either we talk about colonialism or not, that's the big question of the future. Those settlers won't go anyway. And how, how is it possible for Israeli and Palestinians to, to share sovereignty? Um, and if we frame it precisely in, in, in a settler colonial context is then how do we build a narrative that is not only a Jewish narrative, but a narrative where their spaces to honor the culture of the indigenous, which are the Palestinians in, in that case. So it's kind of a debate we're also having in Canada here too, right? How do we yeah. how do we accommodate that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And I mean, what how Canada is moving moving forward right now, after the adoption two years ago by the Trudeau government of the uh, UN Declaration of Indigenous People, is through the implementation of this declaration. So Again, fostering much more self-determination, dialogue from nation to nation, uh, ensuring, you know, making that, sure that first people in that country get access to uh, services that other do get access to, but also that they can not necessarily self-determine, but really self-govern. Um, so that, but once we frame it that way, it, it helps really to acknowledge that Palestinians don't have residual right. They have full rights to, to their culture, their land, their language. I have a little anecdote to contribute here that uh, you'll both appreciate. Uh, about five years ago, it brought uh, Yusuf Jabarin, who Arthur and I have met in, uh, in uh, Haifa many years ago, a, a Palestinian member of the Israeli Knesset at the time, brought him to, to Ottawa for a week to meet people. And I tried to set up some meetings for, with him, um, with some people from our um, uh, indigenous in, 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 Department of Indian Affairs, because um, he was interested in how Canada treats indigenous people and what their policies are and so on. They refused to meet him. They refused to meet him because they were afraid that that would mean that some people would think that we, we Canada, accepted that Palestinians were indigenous, and therefore they didn't want to have anything to do with them. So um, they were quite afraid to touch that uh, Touch that issue, which I was, found quite frustrating. Um, uh, Abe Rosner has a question for both guests. Beside uh, discussions about how to characterize what's happening, what do you think should be done now and who should do it? Okay, this is a big question, so I guess I don't want a complete answer, but give me a little answer here, uh, each of you, or either of you wants to tackle that. Um, well, well I'll, I'll start. I hinted at it before. You know, I, I think that the one thing that uh, right-wing Israelis, and I mean a large part of the spectrum of Israel, simply does not want and does not want to entertain um, is giving up the occupied territories, particularly East Jerusalem and particularly the West Bank. That is the last thing they want to consider. It's also the one thing that's being suggested that's most likely to happen and the international community is most likely to force Israel into is ending the occupation. And I think that's what we have to do. I think boycotts and sanctions are great, but they should be focused on ending the occupation in one way or another. I think we should um, 
Right. And, and, you know, one Israeli military commander after another has said, Israel does not need the territories to be secure. And there's that argument to be made. There's the least possibility of using that argument to call people who call for an end to the occupation anti-Semitic. It's the strongest argument there is, but we should use, I think, what we consider militant tactics to, to push it. In other words, moderate demands with militant tactics. And I, you know, I wrote an article 20 years ago that the West ought to be pushing this slowly and using military force if required in the end, if Israel does not comply. Ending the occupation seems to me, it doesn't solve all the problems, but it's the big point in getting things moving. So that's what I would say. Okay. Um, I have another contribution here from Wolf Ehrlichman. This is a statement, but it kind of re it leads to a response or requires a response from Mikhail or Arthur. Uh, basically, he says that he think, he's arguing that the settler colonial framework is useful, um, first of all, because Israel will not move until there's outside pressure, I mean, that the Israelis are not going to give up the West Bank or give equality to the Palestinians unless there's outside pressure. And the settler colonial framework can help people outside Israel who've mostly been exposed to the Israeli narratives to see things in a different light. And therefore, that is a key, um, for example, that Canadians are becoming familiar with the colonial concept, he thinks, makes it easier uh, to have that concept explained with respect to Israel-Palestine. Although, uh, I have to say, I'm not sure there's a lot of evidence for that so far, but I, could, I get the sentiment. So, M Mikhail, what do you think? I think so. I think so. Uh, I mean, not just surprisingly, but I mean, this. Uh, th there's two things I need to add. Uh, um, it, the first is that settler colonialism as a framework to analyze Palestine is something that emerged from the Palestinians themselves. I mean, the Khalidi family from the, 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 the historian uh, um, right. Khalidi um, in Colombia uh, were part of his great ancestor were in the Ottoman parliament and wrote letters denouncing colonialism coming in uh, in Palestine at the end of the 90th century. And uh, 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 Sayer uh, is one of the, of, of the scholars of the Palestinian side who used that since the 1960s to, to define the situation. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that Palestinians can rely to. And I mean, but the scholarly conversation started really in the 1990s and, and Israeli scholars started to use it in the 80s, but it really got traction in the 1990s and it's becoming not mainstream, but widely used now in the academia, not, 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 not in Jewish studies or in Israel studies, but in Palestine studies, it's mainstream now. There's nothing new apart if you write in French, maybe, uh, to, 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 to declare it settler colonialism. But I think that where it's helpful is that if I need to explain to my mother what's happening to Palestine, and you know, my, my, my mother is a farmer, I would say, well, mom, it's like what's happening in the US and here. It's, you know, getting rid, rid of the natives, taking the land and building a, building a wonderful and nice country, but at what, at what cost? So it, it can be pretty straightforward in how we tell it. And especially, you know, usually people don't want to talk about Israel, Palestine. It's too political, it's too sensitive. You don't want to be, tagged as an anti-Semite. And of course, you will get this anyway if you use settler colonialism. But at the end of the day, it has the advantage of making it quite easy. It's not, you know, there was a war, then there was another war, and something is happening in the territory of the Second War. But in the meantime, there was another war. And, you know, no, it's the old enterprise is, is about replacing a people by another. Well, I, I would just say when you explain to your mother what was going on, you didn't say, oh, well, it's settler colonialism and leave it at that. You told her the details of what was going on. Yes, let's tell people what's going on. We should avoid doing it in a sing-song voice and, uh, you know, and talk about how, um, anyway, we don't need to go into the history, but I think the history of the occupation is very simple. And obviously occupation is part of the story of uh, settler colonialism. I would say to Wolf Ehrlichman, you know, use whatever you find that works. In my 30 years in, you know, 
working in this territory roughly, I find it's easiest to get people on side by simply talking about the occupation. And it's an illegal occupation. It's been going on since 1967. It's been a constant demand of the Palestinians that the occupation should end. It's not something that presents security problems for Israel, etc. So, you know, th there's an overlap, but let's use whatever works. I have a comment here from you okay, Mikhail, could, comment here from uh, Shaki Fahu, who basically seems to agree with you, uh, Arthur. He says that the Palestinian people want to have dignity, basic rights in their own country in 20% of what was Palestine. So that's that's his, uh, I believe he's a Palestinian Canadian, and he, he believes that is what the Palestinian people want. And I'm certain it's true that some do and some don't, but that's a... Yeah. He's, He's mostly in agreement with you. Um, there is another uh, question, though, that uh, Wolf er Ehrlichman again raises a question. He, <laughs> he challenged my my maybe too glib assertion that the Israeli settler colonial project has been largely finished inside Israel and that um, uh, they're trying to accomplish, finish the project in the West Bank. He says it's far from finished. Uh, Mikael or Arthur, have you got a comment on that? Yeah. I, I can jump in. And I mean, that's, I, I understand what, when you say that you mean we need to focus on the occupation, Arthur, because it's mainstream, the internet, there's an international consensus around it, but gosh, I just feel so bad at letting down uh, the Palestinians of 48, who, I mean, just underwent the same process, but it started in 48 instead of started in 67. But, you know, the destruction of those 500 uh, cities and villages after the Nagba, the, 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 the destruction of Jaffa and, and all of that. I mean, that's the same. It was a big replay when they did it in 67 on a longer run period with a denser population and Palestinians in the West Bank were more assertive in 67, whereas they were, they would, I mean, they were, the, the, the Palestinian society was crumbling in 48. So, but I just feel that in focusing only on the occupied territory, we're letting off the Palestinians inside of Israel, where are, which are stuck with, I mean, they, all, they have more rights, but they are still second-class second, second citizens and, and stuck in overcrowded villages where they cannot get building permits, where most of them, I mean, the, most of them won't go to university because it's so difficult for them to make their way into Israeli society. As, 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 I mean, they can do it if they basically erase their whole identity. And so, I mean, I can understand as a priority that we say, let's focus on the West Bank and Gaza the, because people are dying there. But at the same time, what is happening with, with Israeli Palestinians is, 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 is really bad too. Yeah, I would just say that it looks like the interest of, is of Israeli Palestinians has been to get more equal rights within Israel. Yeah, yeah and, that's true. And, you know, I fully support that. Is that as big an international crisis as the occupation? I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. But I sure would support increase, you know, equal, never mind increasing Palestinian yeah. rights in, the, in Israel proper, but but in fact, equal, getting rid of every uh, right that favors Jews in in Israel. I would support that. For every sure. right, you mean every privilege, I assume. I mean, that's... well, yes, every right that Israelis have that Palestinians yeah, yeah. don't. Have, so, right. yeah. Okay. Um, the the part that's um, sort of hanging in the balance here um, is the focus. The the settler colonial focus seems to me to include. The refugees. Yeah. Whereas the focus on the occupation um, tends to put that issue aside. Do, do you agree with that, Arthur? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, I think if if you include the refugee demand and aren't explicit about making it a limited demand. Uh, then you're condemning the whole thing to defeat. Israel will never agree to uh, to Jews being a minority inside uh, Israel, and the international community will never force Israel to agree to that. So I think that you might as well just, uh, you know, 
accept your principles and admit defeat. If you say, as has been done in many attempts at negotiating a settlement between Palestine and Israel on these issues, and you find a limited way to acknowledge uh, Palestinian rights, but a limited number of uh, uh, refugee return, then I think you can that can be acceptable. But yes, I don't I, and I do think, Israelis would rather fight about refugees because A, they'll never give in and B, they'll never be forced to accept all the refugees. And they would sooner have refugees return, more Palestinians living in, in Israel proper than they would give up the West Bank forever. I still think they'd rather have more refugees than give up the West Bank. So they would shift the argument to that. I'm going to try. Shahi said that I didn't do a very good justice to his earlier question, so I'm going to I'm going to read his question here um, carefully and listen. Or maybe you guys can can you read it at the same time? Maybe you can see the chat there. It says you didn't finish my question. Yes, you're right with all that you mentioned. One state, two states, boycott, apartheid, discrimination. I want to hear what and how the process can be moved forward because all of what you mentioned has been tried. We are at a very dangerous crossroads for both. Israelis and Palestinians, a new young, a new young generation of Palestinian men and women. The occupation generation is the new light on the Palestinian people. There are several pieces to that. Um, pick it up e any way you'd like to. E either either one of you. Um, well, I'll I'll respond. I can't. I don't see that whole question and we haven't really touched much on what's happened since the election uh, of the new government uh, and and the increase in violence that's taking place and how does that change the whole situation and and I don't have a you know simple answer for that um, it's easy to hope that if things get bad enough the international community will actually step in but that's a hard hope to to maintain so i don't know how to answer shaki's longer question mm -hmm. that, 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 i mean it's, it's it's so easy to explain what's happening and so difficult to explain what should we do really uh, i mean you maybe you can add to that peter because i know that you you've been you've pretty involved in, in different strategies but i i really think that there's something to do with you know with with with, with the apartheid report of human rights watch amnesty and what betselem did too and to 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 make public what's happening and in in in, in israel palestine and to, to renew the call for 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 boycott and sanction and again the problem is it works for south africa will it work with, with at this particular moment in history in israel where there's a really wide wing uh, government where the jewish population seems to be quite hesitant since what's happened of the oslo process to get uh, involved in, in something else but at the end of the day if it's hitting the pockets of Israelis, that that was the paper of Gideon Levy in Aretz yesterday. That's the, what's happening with the with with, with the new the, the 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 new reform of the Netanyahu government is having a, a huge impact on on the finance of the the country, and some people are looking to leave. And I mean, if we put enough pressure on Israel, maybe the money side of things may bring. Uh, leaders to see things differently and not that they will completely change their narrative but they might be open to some compromises that they are not open at all today so i think there's where we're not done at all with with the push uh, not so much for but for a boycott but to push for sanction it's not, it's not even started so there's really something to explore there i think i think that we have we face a difficult um challenge in Canada, um, I think exemplified by what happened in uh, in Nablus uh, yesterday. It's hardly been covered. I wasn't in the Citizen at all today. It's hardly been covered anywhere. We're much more interested in Mr. Biden in uh, uh, making speeches in Kiev or Poland or whatever. 
Um, and it's not uh, uh, um, either are we willing to countenance, um, even seriously respond to the reports from Amnesty International, from uh, Human Rights Watch and so on, alleging crimes. Um, uh, in their view, uh, apartheid has gone from being a kind of an epithet to being an actual um, uh, allegation of a criminal act uh, with proofs to be brought forward. Um, but um, they, that has been totally rebuffed by the Canadian government. Uh, OFEP has been trying to get a, an op-ed on this issue into the globe, into the star, not saying that, not, not claiming that Israel is an apartheid state, but saying that serious organizations have made that claim and um, Canadian government should, can do better than just say we don't agree, that it requires something more substantive than that. And uh, we have not even been able to get an op-ed in a paper making that allegation. So the the resistance to criticizing Israel um, at both the political level and in our major media is very, very um, significant. It's a challenge we face. And uh, I think it's a moot point about whether or not the settler, I don't know whether we'd have a better argument doing an op-ed on settler colonialism. I tend to think that would be worse <laughs> than making an argument on, on, uh, on apartheid, where, where at least um, some serious organizations have made the allocation with, and, and there is a legal definition of it. So, Yeah, I um, would say, why is that? Why why uh, are you having trouble getting that, that op-ed into the paper? The bigger question is, why is there a history of having trouble getting it, things like that, into the paper? This is, you know, one could say, well, uh, you know, the crises in in Syria and Turkey, the earthquakes are happening now. And COVID, that, COVID. Happened to pick this time to go to, uh, to uh, Ukraine. And there's a lot of competition for news stories and stuff. But we know this is an ongoing problem. Um, and I, you know, and I would say it's very simple, really. The, the bad guys in this case are Jews. And the world that we live in, our part of the world, but really almost all the world, does not want to criticize Jews, does not want to create the potential for violence against Jews. There's a great deal of guilt and, and it's a liberal self-definition of people. Pe people who consider themselves liberals, it means they defend Jews. They might not like what's going on in Palestine, but they defend Jews against almost every, I think that's what we're facing. And, you know, um, Edward Said quoted someone else who I forget, who said, you know, 30 years ago, the tragedy of the Palestinians is that they're oppressed by the victims of the world. And when we sit down to try to figure and when Palestinians sit down to try to figure out a strategy that those facts have to be part of working out a strategy. It's very sad it's, for Palestinians particularly that you can't just call them Nazis and you can't just and you can't say it's apartheid and everybody leaps forward and says, yes, it's apartheid. Let's stop it. Nobody felt sentimental about, about um you know, South Afrikaners, the Afrikaners, right? Nobody feels sentimental about Russians when they invade uh, uh, the Ukraine. But when Jews oppress people, a lot of people feel defensive about Jews. And I, you know, that to me is the big problem that needs to be worked around. Okay. Interesting. And the last, last question to both of you. Um, as we're getting near the end of our time here, it's, it's an interesting question by from Robin Collins. I will read it. Is the settler colonial goal, that is to say that I think the framing is a settler colonial issue, is it in part a sly desire to reverse the legitimacy of Israel? Um, if so, it seems insurmountable given UN decisions regarding the creation of the Israeli state in the beginning, whereas the reversal of the occupation West, uh, and the two-state proposal have long-standing UN legitimacy. So that seems to be 
similar to your argument, um, Arthur. I think that's. But Mikael, do you want to respond to that? How do you how do you respond to that? Is it a sly effort on your part to delegitimize Israel, Mikael? That's <laughs> well, I, I would say that I well, I, I, I will under, I will answer the question by a story. And honestly, uh, before I I came to that paradigm for my thesis, because I mean it was an existential and intellectual quest. I was stuck in the with the idea of an ethnic conflict, but it didn't make sense because everything is so disproportionate when you look at what's happening to the Palestinians and what's happening to the Israelis. And one I, I discovered, well, discovered, just read about this, this whole idea. I said, okay, that makes sense. That helped me to have some kind of framework to picture what's happening. And it's not so, my goal was really to find how do I connect the dots to make sense of a situation that everyone says, oh, it's complex, it's complex, it's complex. Well, when you have this overall framework, you can connect the dots with what's happening in Gaza, what's happening in Jerusalem, what's happening in the West Bank, what's happening in Israel proper. And it's somehow a related process. And while doing that, I guess, is not so much that is removing some digitalizing Israel, but it's it's putting into questions the, the end goal of the project or, or making it a bit less pure than simply redeeming Jews and starting to put more emphasis on the collateral damage while big building this new heaven for, for the Jews. And, and I think that at the end of the day, Settler colonialism may, might well lead into an Israeli one-state solution that is a bit more progressive and free for all, as it can lead to a total rehearsal of the state and the creation of something else. And I mean, South, the new South Africa, the rainbow South Africa is not imperfect and still wears the heavy traits of what colonialism was and still is in the economic inequalities. So I don't think that secular colonialism, even settler colonialism, settler colonialism will make Israel vanish tomorrow. But it's a way to look at the state and say, okay, well, there is a need to redefine some of the parameters if we take that seriously. And that, that's what anti-Zionist uh, militants and intellectuals started in the 1990s, but also with the new historians and everything. Um, and some Israelis were really involved into that, but you know, a lot of that is, is gone since the second intifada. Well, Michael and Arthur, Thank you for your time and your energy tonight. Thanks to all those who posed lots of good questions in the Q&A. And I see there was a lively conversation going along in parallel in the chat, but I didn't really notice, uh, wasn't able to follow that uh, in detail. Um, I think that, um, I don't think we came to a conclusion, uh, but I think we've enriched our understandings of both the the, the strength and the the force of the settler colonial analysis and also raise some significant issues around whether or not it's going to help us move towards a more just society for everybody uh, going forward. So I really want to thank um, Arthur and Mikael so much for their time, for having prepared this. I'd like to remind people of two things. One is, first of all, our next webinar, which is a fascinating interview with uh, Fida Jiris, this returning Palestinian refugee actually a, a refugee in the sense that her parents were refugees, but she was born in Lebanon and then came back to, to live in Israel and talks about her, what it's like as a Palestinian to live in Israel uh, today. And also I remind people that uh, OFEP is a not-for-profit uh, organization. We have expenses there. The webinars we put on for free, but we do appreciate uh, donations that help us cover our expenses. They can come in any amount. Um, uh, I see that, um, Grafton has also put on the in the chat uh, the website of the Ottawa Forum on Israel Palestine. Grafton, thank you very much for doing that. Um, I will be sending to all of you and to all the other people who uh, registered but didn't attend a video of this event, um, so you can share it with your friends. Um, and um, um, that's great. Thank you very much for this evening. Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.